Hey, deserving listeners, Johnny Depp, Amber Heard trial. Let's watch. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's watch. Testimony? Yes, I do. And what is your opinion? I, I have a couple of primary opinions. Um, the first is, is, is that I, my opinion is that he violated the ethical principles that are outlined in the Goldwater Rule when he gave his opinions about um, Mr. Depp, specifically with relationship to personality traits and... Wow. So this is vindicating for me because I, I was saying that and also, me, <laughs> I mean, who cares about me? It's Johnny Depp's team that is looking for vindication on what Dr. Spiegel was saying. So he has called in specifically to comment on Dr. Spiegel. It's interesting because he said he was sitting in the audience and Johnny Depp's team knew to have him observe because they suspected that he was going to say something or maybe they even knew what he was going to say anyway so he is saying as a psychiatrist dr spiegel violated the ethical standard of the goldwater rule which in terms of the way i interpret that ethical guideline not only just for psychiatrists but for everyone in our field including forensic psychologists by the way i was interpreting it that way so maybe there's a lot of people that would agree with dr spiegel but in my circle this represents what my circle would say. And his cognitive abilities. Um, my second primary opinion would be that um, the re that the Dr. Spiegel's opinions um, were unreliable, and that he had insufficient Objection, information. Your Objection, Your Honor. All right. Okay, so one, that he violated the Goldwater Rule, and two, that his conclusions were based on insufficient information. Better defined and expanded in, in some, to some degree. So, for example, in 2017, in this, this publication, they, the APA... Right, so I don't know if you remember me talking about this earlier. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it, that every time a new president is elected, there is a lot of talk about diagnosing from afar and the Goldwater Rule. And in particular, it was necessary to discuss this in 2017 when Do Donald Trump became president. And there were a lot of clinicians who came forward stating publicly that he was, Donald Trump was unfit for office due to a psychiatric disorder, which I've already been over that. It, it's ridiculous to claim that you can absolutely, you could claim he's a terrible president. You could claim that he shouldn't be in office. You can claim that he's a dangerous, horrible human being. Those aren't diagnoses. You, you know, that there's no ethical code regarding a psychiatrist who during their off hours makes a proclamation that a politician is a danger to us all. There's no ethical code around that, generally speaking, depending on what you say. But there is an ethical code about diagnosing someone from afar and saying because of that diagnosis, they are unfit for their office. So in 2017, there were a lot of clinicians. And by the way, I don't make any friends. I say this every time. Everyone in my circle, uh, for the most part, it was not fond of Donald Trump. I'll just put it that way. So when I speak out against it, I'm not I'm not speaking in support of Donald Trump. I'm speaking in support of my profession, of all of our professions as mental health clinicians. I'm trying to defend us. I'm not trying to defend a president. Plus, if we allow that to happen, then when a Democratic president is elected, then all the Republican psychiatrists and mental health clinicians can diagnose that person and deem that person to be unfit for office. Do we want to live in that kind of society, that kind of ridiculousness? I would say not. So let's just follow our ethical codes. Now, I believe in 2017, the argument by those who were coming forward were saying that they have to follow Tarasov, which is a legal slash ethical guideline for most mental health clinicians, dictating that we, if, if we hear from, while we're working from a client, say, who says that they're going to kill someone or harm someone, that we actually have to do what we can to preserve life, to, to warn that individual, call the police, or if we have the actual name of the person actually reach out to them and say, by the way, my client said that they're going to hurt you. There's nuance to that. But they were saying, I believe, that because they, these clinicians, were aware that Donald Trump was going to harm other people, they had a, an ethical obligation to get him out of office by diagnosing something like that. I mean, it was really dubious. I mean, it was just reaching. I understand when people have political passions. I understand when people are afraid. They, they very well could be be right. They could have been right. One could make an argument that uh, him in office absolutely
absolutely did create problems. But, you know, that's for politics. That's for, you know, picketing. That's for voting. That's for op-eds. It's not for diagnosing. That person, um, if it's that opinion is made using the expertise, experience, and knowledge inherent in the practice of psychiatry, that is considered a professional opinion. So it, it might include making a diagnosis or not making a diagnosis. Okay, I didn't know that. So he's clarifying that the Goldwater rule has been refined over time for psychiatrists, and it doesn't just pertain to diagnoses. It in includes any professional opinion. I'm guessing that's because there were abuses to the Goldwater rule by people saying, look, I didn't diagnose the person. I was just labeling them as having narcissistic traits or that kind of silliness. And they said, okay, well, <laughs> we I guess we have to include all professional opinions. And uh, he's saying that that does pertain, that is specific defined according to him and I believe him and it does pertain to what Dr. Spiegel was saying yesterday yeah but there are exceptions and situations in which an expert can give testimony in court so one good example would be if there was a medical malpractice case or if there was a case about that involved a patient who'd committed suicide and the courts wanted to find out whether the psychiatrist had followed appropriate practice the expert can review medical records and can give an opinion based on those records, provided those records um, have sufficient information, for example, about... Right, so that's another example of a uh, clinician providing a professional opinion in court without having directly evaluated the individual in question that if someone dies by suicide and an expert is called in to review the case, the professional will look at the notes, will gather all the information they can and try to determine the accuracy of the diagnosis, the treatment, all that kind of thing. So yeah, there, there are exceptions to that, but I don't think this applies. I'm, I'm guessing that's what he's gonna say. Uh, well, well, my opinion is that he did not. He expressed a number of professional opinions about Mr. Depp that we heard about yesterday. Again, he did so without an evaluation, without consent. He did not follow the guidelines of the APA in the 2017 revision, where it was considered important that there'd be sufficient information obtained by that expert to give an opinion. Yeah, I was saying this at the time, but particularly now, the way that he presented himself, not only in his testimony, but in his demeanor, to me, it just seemed to call everything he was saying, or most of what he was saying, into question. And I don't know the jury's take. Make it seem like Mr. Depp met criteria for narcissistic personality traits. And I'll just mention a couple of them, just, just, just to illustrate my opinion, is that that testimony was did not really hold together. So he stated, for example, that one of the criteria for narcissism is um, narcissistic personality disorder is a sense of entitlement. And the example Dr. Spiegel gave is that he believed that Miss Heard married him for his money. So clearly, sense of entitlement is a, from a psychiatry perspective, that's very different from a belief that someone wanted you for your money. Yeah, I mean, I was saying that uh, in the previous video as well. I hope he elaborates a little bit on that. But yeah, I was saying essentially the same thing. A second example that um, was given was that he was asked to give an example of how Mr. Depp had shown that he was envious of others, which is another criterion for narcissistic personality disorder. And the example that Dr. Spiegel gave is that Mr. Depp was jealous of Ms. Hurd because he believed she was having an affair with Mr. Franco. Now, if we look at these two terms as a psychiatrist, there's a big difference between being envious and being jealous. Yeah, I, I was saying the same thing in a less articulate, concise manner. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm so glad that he is on the stand. This is very satisfying to watch. As a psychiatrist, when I think about envy, I think about somebody wants something that someone else has, and it makes them get bad. I think this is going beyond his participation. He, he's giving his opinion as to how Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater rule with respect to his testimony about narcissistic personality he, traits. He, he did, but now sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. How do you sustain that objection? He was about to explain the difference between envy and jealousy, which is a central feature of the testimony that Dr. Spiegel gave. And 
absolutely is a sound rebuttal. Yeah, so the mini mental status is, um, it's a series of about 10 or 11 questions and tasks that someone completes and you get a score out of 30. Um, what Dr. Uh, Spiegel testified was that Mr. Depp could not recall three words after five minutes. And he used that as an example of Mr. Depp having cognitive deficits that he specifically attributed to Mr. Depp's alcohol and substance abuse. He really did not have sufficient information. I, I liken a, a mini mental status exam. It's, it's like taking someone's temperature. Yeah, I don't know if I said this at the time, but I was thinking the same thing, which is that the mini mental status exam, the purpose of it is to catch things if you can, because we might miss something in the overall interview. It's designed to be a, a series of short questions. If they indicate something, then you would want to go down a road. So if you, for example, had a patient that couldn't remember the, you know, the standard number of items on the three, you know, you, you give three words, tell me all the words that you remember that I said a bit, a little, little bit ago. If the person indicated they didn't understand any, any of the words, you would not diagnose nose from that data point, you would say, okay, now let's maybe, or you would say maybe tomorrow we're going to have to do this other memory test. And the official tests that are available to forensic individuals are elaborate and they're standard and they're well known. <laughs> they take a while to take. Processing speed is the same thing. You would never look at someone, give a, if that was true, then why do we have the tests? <laughs> Do you agree with Dr. Spiegel that the Goldwater Rule doesn't apply to expert witnesses? I, I don't agree, no. How could Dr. Spiegel express an opinion without violating the Goldwater Rule? This has actually been a, a topic that's been written and published about, so it is possible for someone to give testimony. I'm really glad that they're touching on this. I don't know exactly what he's going to say, but what I would say is things I was saying before, which is to say this is speculative based on what I have observed uh, without having evaluated the person in question. There are signs of this, but I don't know if they actually suffer from that or if those indications are signs of something else or signs of nothing. But I will tell you that if I saw that, then it, I would wonder if this was the case. That's one option that I often will say when I'm providing content on the internet. However, what he, could, what he should have done in expressing his opinion is then have followed up to say that in order to really establish whether these were relevant and significant cognitive deficits, Mr. Depp should have had psychological testing to establish the nature of these deficits. Yes, especially when it comes to memory and processing speed. Those are very specific things that we have very specific instruments around. And I don't know anyone that I've heard of who would try to, you would maybe take guesses, but they would say, but you know, we gotta do the test because the tests are very good at testing that sort of thing. Like one of the processing speed tests that I remember using involved this grid of different circles and shapes and colors and you had to circle, you're looking at the word red, but it's in the color of blue, and you have to go as fast as you can. So that's processing speed, right? Because you're, you're reading the word, and there's a little bit of a thing, you're like, okay, you look at the color, don't look at the word, and the slower the processing, I, I'm pretty sure this measures processing speed. And then we have the standardized in terms of we, you know, administer, the researchers that develop these instruments will administer it to thousands of people, and will get norms, meaning averages or bell curves, for a certain certain age group. And then when you get your score, you compare your score with people in your age group or whatever sort of grouping you are comparing yourself to. And then you get a where you are in terms of the average and standard deviation. Clinicians need to be there because you never know the state of the patient that is taking these tests. You know, if you just gave these tests online, you can't guarantee that their space is quiet, that the individual isn't distracted. That's why it requires professionals to administer these tests and to code them and to interpret them with expertise. He gave an opinion about um, cognitive deficits that required psychological testing to be further um, evaluated. And that explains maybe the way in which he came across, how unprepared he seemed to be to me, how unrefined his answers were, how unconvincing he seemed, how random some of his responses were, how almost reckless. I mean, there were things that he said that I thought were actually 
counter to the Amber Heard team's opinion. And his use of language, like the word idiot. Yeah, from about halfway through Dr. Spiegel's testimony, I was like, does this guy know what he's doing? And I don't know, maybe he does. But then there's this further speculation that I had, which is that the Amber Heard team was desperately looking for someone who would diagnose Johnny Depp so that they could influence the jury. And they, I'm guessing, I don't know, asked a lot of forensic psychologists and offered a lot of money. And the forensic psychologists, including Dr. Hughes, I'm guessing, said, no, I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> That's just not, unless he submits to an evaluation, there's no way I can confidently or ethically diagnose him with anything. So they found someone that didn't know what they were doing, that didn't know about the profession, that didn't know about the ethics involved. <laughs> I mean, I get, I'm speculating upon speculations. Um, Dr. Shaw, yesterday, Dr. Spiegel was talking about correlation and causation. What is the difference between correlation and causation? Yeah. So when he was asked that question, Dr. Spiegel, he said correlation meant risk factor and causation meant you had it. Smoking is according to what he was saying, a correlation, because it's correlated with lung cancer and emphysema. So it's a risk factor. And then causation is actually having it. <laughs> it was weird. So uh, yeah, I hope that they go over this. So a correlation doesn't say anything about whether or not these factors caused the, the behavior he was, was discussing. Perhaps one of the easiest ways I could describe this difference between correlation and causation is if we, if we look at the issue of, of measles, if you bear with me. So there's a correlation between being young and catching measles. Now we know that measles is not caused by being young. Measles is caused by a virus. But young children have not been exposed to the virus. They don't have the immunity, so they have a higher rate of measles. So the difference statistically is well, well, the difference is, is between causation and correlation is illustrated by that example. So, yes, that's a much better explanation of correlation and causation. Yeah, I, I, yeah this is just so satisfying. Dr. Spiegel's testimony and the questions that he was being asked by Amber Heard's lawyer, I just felt like I was in a strange world. Like, I just felt like, what is going on right now? And it's just so nice to hear things that I'm very familiar with being said. Another way I might put this is if, you know, if we had a hundred people in a room, just bringing it back to the issue of IPV that Dr. Spiegel was testifying about. Let's say we had 70 people who had all the risk factors for IPV and 30 people who had no risk factors for IPV. So what can we say about the, those 70 people? We can't say that any single one of those people has perpetrated IPV, even though they may have all the risk factors. And if we look at the 30 people who have no risk factors, we also can't say whether or not they have. This is such an excellent analogy. I can't believe how, how good this guy is. I mean, that's perfect. That's perfect. I perpetrated IPV. So the actual presence of risk factors for IPV that Dr. Spiegel was talking about, they say absolutely nothing about what happened in this case. People who listen to my podcast when I review ethical cases in which clinicians who have committed ethical violations or illegal acts while they are in the process of helping or working with clients, working professionally. In fact, I just got an email from my malpractice insurance giving a lot of examples of people who have been sex successfully sued. I, I love these briefs, these um, case briefs that they send out because it's good podcast content, but it also just gives real life examples of how courts and ethical boards tend to rule on these things because in my field mental health clinicians they often will tell each other what is the law or how it's regulated or what the ethical codes mean we as a group when we just decide that on our own we tend to believe things that aren't true like rumors kind of get swirled around because there's so much ambiguity it's hard to know exactly how to interpret these ethical codes and laws sometimes and so when i actually get these examples of how the courts rule how the ethical you know the the licensing boards how they will rule on things and they're not always consistent but they're often different than the way that people will 
believe. And by the way, that rumor process results in professors and supervisors that will perpetuate these rumors. It's like this weird closed system that doesn't often interact with the actual places in which these decisions are being made. That doesn't mean that these people are worthless, but what I tell people clinicians out there, if you ever want to get consultation from someone that actually knows ethics and law in our field, you have to work with someone that actually goes to those places where the decisions are being made. You can't learn that from a book. The books don't always tell us exactly what, and, and things change over time. You know, courts will change, licensing boards will change over time. And so the people that I go to, and I've had them on the podcast before, are people that actually work in those cases. Like I have a friend who is an attorney and a clinician, and she actually will defend fellow clinicians or be part of the complaining process against a clinician. And she knows exactly how all those things work. She understands how judges work, how licensing boards will work. And thus her knowledge is actually ground level and very sound and very buttoned up and very valuable. And sometimes it completely contradicts what you will learn in a graduate school class on ethics, which is bizarre, really. Not all the time, obviously. So I'm saying all this because for Dr. Spiegel, he might have a lot of colleagues that he works with who think everything that he did was totally fine, but it's because they're in this weird echo. Another aspect of this that I should mention is that a lot of mental health clinicians, particularly people of certain identities, white men, I suppose, they believe that they're beyond reproach. I've seen this attitude before. You know, when you become a, prof and I'll just speak from my own experience, when you become a therapist, you're kind of the, especially when you no longer have a supervisor and you're free to practice without oversight, which is pretty early in one's career, you're kind of the king of your own domain because clients come in and you treat them and you say lots of things and you advise in certain ways and you provide research or whatever. And no one's really there to refute you. No one is really there to criticize you in a way that seems very valid. I mean, certainly people will criticize, but often it's not coming from a place of expertise. It's just a client that just doesn't like what you're doing or whatever. And of course, we're trained to listen to that. But you end up starting to really feel... And, and a lot of clients will be very grateful for your help. And so there's this temptation to start to believe that you know more than what you know and you're competent in areas when you're not actually competent. It reminds me of when Julius Caesar and other generals, when they were given a tribute in Rome, having conquered Gaul and all these places, the tribute was the pinnacle of someone's life. If you could have a tribute, you know, it's this big parade and party in Rome that honors you, that they would have a slave that would be right next to you at all times, frequently telling you, you're not a god, you're human. You're you're not a god, you're human. I like that image, that they would have some kind of measure in place to make sure that the individual, although we are elevating you, you're not God. You're still a human being. And remember to be humble. Remember to know your limitations, even though no one else is around to necessarily point that out. You know, when you're in graduate school, you're constantly be remi being reminded of how limited you are <laughs> because you're comparing yourself to your classmates, to your professors. You're just like, man, I feel like I'm completely lost. I have no idea what's happening. So then also professors even have it worse because when you're a professor, you often feel like you're even further up the latter, and you're the master of, tr of training other therapists. You know stuff. And of course, students don't know enough necessarily to criticize you, or they don't feel safe enough to criticize you. And so you do this long enough, you can really start believing that you know everything and you can do anything. And I've seen people exhibit seemingly that attitude. And I will say that I have suffered from that at times, for sure, where, I mean, not to that degree that I, I would say, but times where I start to forget my limitations. I start to forget to be humble. I start to believe that I am smart on all things and, and will comment on all things. I don't know if that is happening in this, in this situation, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't a factor. Uh, you're not offering any opinion as to Mr. Depp's psychology, correct? That's correct. That's such a ridiculous question. I mean, I guess it's relevant, but it's like, well, what do you think? <laughs> yes, of course, I haven't evaluated. That's the whole point. In fact, yes, I'm not offering an opinion on him because I didn't evaluate him. And Dr. Spiegel should have said the same thing. 
And you, before this case, you've never offered an opinion on the Goldwater Rule before, correct? That's correct. And you've never written an article on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. So, do they think this some... So, to me, this means nothing. If anything, it points out how rare it is that someone will break the Goldwater Rule in a court case. It's like asking, have you ever given expert testimony on a psychologist, a psychiatrist who gets on the stand and then proceeds to beat up the jury? You'd be like, no, I've, I've never given a testimony on that because it almost never happens. <laughs> so... Yeah. And you wouldn't need to write an article about the Goldwater Rule because it's so fundamental and easy to understand and well written about with other people. Now, maybe this is just excellent lawyership and the jury's like, oh, OK. But to me, it's like if you ask someone to come on the on the stand and give an opinion about IPV and they had never given a testimony about that before, they had never written any articles, they didn't have any training in it, then, yeah, that calls into question their expertise. But a basic ethical code that everyone knows. It's not usually needed to write anything about that because it's not very complicated. <laughs> and you've never given a presentation on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. And you've never been on any committees regarding the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. And you've never made a collage involving the Goldwater Rule, correct? And you've never done an interpretive dance involving the... <laughs> Sorry. And you, you agree that you've testified that there are exceptions to the Goldwater Rule about having to interview the subject, right? Yes. And you understand that Dr. Spiegel requested to meet with Mr. Depp twice, but Mr. Depp declined, correct? I'm aware of that. And Mr. D Mr. Dr. Spiegel stated in his designation and at, at trial yesterday that he did not meet with Mr. Depp, right? What's your point? <laughs> Uh, I mean, maybe this is going somewhere. Uh, you're aware that he asked to talk with Johnny Depp and Johnny Depp refused, right? Yeah, that doesn't give you the right to diagnose from afar, <laughs> uh, especially with the data he provided. I mean, if he had, you know, there's a world in which there was absolutely enough data that one could maybe make a diagnosis. I would never in that situation, but maybe. But the stuff he was pulling in as data was ridiculous. Yes. Okay. This objection attempts to subsume the rule with its exceptions. What this objection misses, however, is that the rendering of expertise and or an opinion in these contexts is permissible because there is a court authorization for the examination or an opinion without examination. And this work is conducted within an evaluative framework, including parameters for how and where the information may be used or disseminated. Yes, he already talked about this. He talked about there are special cases in which you can do that. Like if someone died by suicide and you asked a, an expert witness to come in and review the case, then yeah, those are the kinds of things where it's permitted. Not when Johnny Depp is sitting right there. <laughs> And especially not when you're gathering information from, what was he saying? That Johnny Depp stated that he was jealous. And that's an indication that he has narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> you see that? I do, yes. And, and this court authorized Dr. Spiegel to testify in this case, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Uh, I mean, maybe he's reaching and he's just like i got nothing so uh, in fact it kind of looks like that because you'd think you'd have more there then yeah he did the best job he could under the circumstances to salvage the situation because he got the expert witness to say yes that is saying that there are exceptions to the gold water rule as i said earlier but yes it does say that i have no further questions like trying to say to the jury that okay case closed let's move on and uh <laughs> yeah Hopefully, they, you know, they ask, does what Dr. Spiegel did in this case, does that, according to your opinion, meet that exception criteria in that document? And it's like, no, it does not. Dr. Shaw, um, Mr. Nadelhoff just asked you about the court authorization of uh, Mr. Depp's evaluation. Are you aware that the court has twice denied Ms. Hurd's request for an evaluation of Mr. Depp? I heard that yesterday in, in testimony, yes. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Uh, they should have asked that question I thought of. <laughs> but maybe somehow that's helpful to the jury. I think that's a missed opportunity right there. But what do I know?
I know nothing about the law. She knows a billion times more than I do. So I don't know. Maybe that was the best choice. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.